my name is Stephanie Packer, and I am a wife and a mother of four. And uh, I've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Um, the primary diagnosis is scleroderma with pulmonary fibrosis. Um, scleroderma normally isn't a terminal illness in and of itself, but in some patients who have the diffuse form of scleroderma, their organs become involved. And for me, it attacked my lungs and caused pulmonary fibrosis. And the prognosis, uh, the doctor said that it is terminal. I run different support groups for people with scleroderma-specific disease, and then also people that just have chronic illnesses. And in a couple of our groups, as soon as the, the Brittany Menard story came out and really started taking place, the feeling in our support groups really changed very quickly. And the conversation was different. Normally, we would talk about support and love and we would uh, be there for each other and just encourage them that, you know, today's a bad day, tomorrow doesn't have to be. After that story took place in the national spotlight, the conversation turned to, well, maybe it is time for me to stop trying to fight a terminal illness. And people, once they became depressed, it became negative and it started consuming people. Then they said, you know what, I wish I could just end it. I was really concerned about what was going to happen with doctor-patient relationships. Uh, me personally, I have a very large medical team and they've been absolutely wonderful and encouraged and they inform me and they help me do more things and they yell at me when I need to be yelled at and, and it's just, we built this great relationship. As I began to really study and investigate physician-assisted suicide from the past and uh, you know, case studies in Oregon, and I tried reading as much information as I could. And as I did that, I started really becoming upset at the different problems that I saw with this, aside from the actual taking of a life and how I felt about that and on a moral level, that what it did to patients, what I was finding out there was really alarming because patients are, are going to die because of this. And yes, they do have a terminal illness. We do know that they're going to die, but um, this changed it. When I joined the movement against it, I, I went to all of my doctors and I asked them how they felt about it and what their opinion was. And because I was concerned it was going to affect me and my care and, you know, what, what options they would be giving me. So I was worried that this law would change that relationship and that dynamic that I had with my doctors. And fortunately for me, when the law changed, my doctors, they were all the same. And um, that didn't change. But uh, the, I had trouble with the insurance company though. For a while, five months or so, we've been trying to get me on a different chemotherapy drug for the infusions because my doctor felt that it would be less toxic than some of the other drugs that we were going to be using. And uh, I was going back and forth and finally I had heard back from them and they said, yes, we're going to get it covered. We just have to fix a couple of things. And when the law was passed, it was a week later, I received a letter in the mail saying that they were going to deny coverage for the chemotherapy that we were asking for. And that was really hard for me to hear because you know I was already upset about this disease and about this law and trying to balance what that was going to mean for me. And then all of a sudden, right in my face was this fear that I had with this come to life. And they were going to deny it. They didn't want to pay the money for it. On my letter, it didn't say anything about physician-assisted suicide as far as you know why they were denying me. So I wanted to, to find out a little bit more about what was going on. So I called the insurance company and I was asking them why I didn't get approved for this drug. And they kind of gave me this, this roundabout story and I wasn't really getting clear answers. So I said, well, what about the drugs that they're using for the new law? 
and she she paused for a minute and she says, what are you talking about? And I told her, you know, this physician-assisted suicide, there are these pills that I could get. And I said, well, would you, would you cover that for me? And she says, yes, we do provide that to our, our patients and you would only have to pay a dollar and 20 cents for the medication. And it was just like someone just hit me in the gut. In front of me, I had the validation that all my fears were, were correct. My doctor had appealed it. He appealed this decision twice and they're still coming back saying no. After I, I got this news, and um, after I posted on Facebook, of course, because that, that came first, um, I immediately called a couple of my doctors, and then I contacted different people from the coalition, because patients need to know what this means, and the public need to know that, um, I mean, it's going to kill these patients because they're not going to get the treatments that they need to extend their life. I think that patients are much more susceptible to feelings of depression and um, people that that are suicidal and that are taking, talking about taking their lives. That's, that's really heavy stuff. And we're called as people, as just humanity, to support each other, to hold that person's hand and walk them through this journey. I, I want to live for my kids. I want them to see that dying, dying is a part of life. Your end of life can be, it can be that opportunity to appreciate things that you didn't appreciate before, to say things that you didn't say before. We get to sit and talk about these things. Because Americans especially, I don't know where this ever came from, but we don't talk about death ever. It's, you know, this, it's like a four-letter word. You don't, you don't talk about it, don't discuss it. That's a sad thing. Put it aside until you have to deal with it. Where it should be a conversation. How do you want to die? What do you want your life to be like? What should we do? How can we support you at the end? And I've been able to have those conversations uh, proponents of this law have really have really twisted not only the words but they've twisted what it it means to live with a terminal illness and people are talking about you know we have a right to die we have a right to die and you know what everybody's going to die but no one has ever had the right to kill themselves it's so sad people have the right to stop treatment that's your choice. Doctors can make you comfortable and you can let your body shut down naturally how it's supposed to be. Compassion and choices, um, they've challenged me a lot. They're trying to change definitions of words to make it sound sweet and pretty and tempting. So when we're talking about a person taking their life, you are actively killing yourself. You're, you're doing that. And they're, they're talking about how this isn't suicide. This is physician-assisted death. And they're dying anyway, so they're not committing suicide. And it's maddening to me. It's maddening to me. The definition of suicide, you're taking your life. Patients that are choosing death, you can choose to stop treatment. You can choose to end your life, but it should not ever be supported by physicians and it should not ever be supported or run by the government. That's not okay. Because you allowing those patients to make that choices, that choice, affects me negatively and it affects my fight and my ability to stay here longer with my children. I want to carry on. I want to do everything I have to have one more second with my kids. And as soon as this law was passed and 
You see it everywhere. When these laws are passed, patients fighting for a longer life end up getting denied treatment because this will always be the cheapest option. End of life care is the most expensive care everywhere. It is really, really hard to financially fight. And I get that. And we need to fix that. But giving people the opportunity to kill themselves, that's not fixing it. That's making terminally ill people feel like they're less than, that they are not worthy of that fight, that they're not worth it. When I go places and, and meet people or if I'm speaking or even just at the grocery store and I'm wearing an assisted suicide shirt that says something about it, you know, I, I welcome conversations and discussion and education. We need to educate people and let them know what it really is. It's always brought up. What if, you know, I'm abandoned and I'm alone or if my family's all dead already and I don't have friends and I don't have a church community and people get upset at me for talking because they, uh, look, look, you have all of this. So of course it's easier for you to choose this and to want to live longer. And what about the people that have nothing? And um, no one has nothing. No one has nothing. Everybody has something. And there are resources out there. And this is what we should be talking about and fighting for. We need to educate the doctors on end-of-life care. There are support groups everywhere. And you're sick and you're dying in your bed. We will come to your house and we will sit with you. We'll hold your hand. We'll make you some food. We'll give you company. And, okay, you're, you're too tired to talk today, but I'll sit there in silence with you so you know you're not alone. There are so many resources out there for patients to to make better decisions, but unfortunately we're putting so much time and energy and money into campaigns like this. For me personally, I use, gosh, I use every resource I can get. I, I, um, I learn from them and I have a face-to-face -face support group that I actually lead for the Scleroderma Foundation and there are just a ridiculous amount of Facebook support groups where people are there and you're stuck in bed, not you're on a computer. There are places that you can call to get them food to make sure that that's covered. There are resources through, you know, social services that will get them in a shelter for a transitional period and then they will actually place them in, you know, an apartment or a shared home at no cost, and then bring in a palliative care team or a hospice care team where even though you don't have the, the finances, they will get you the pain medication you need. They will make sure that you're in a sterile environment. There's the psychological care, one-on-one -on -one doctors, and that's out there for everyone. You just need to know where to look. And unless and until People decide to just smarten up and realize that that's where the money should go. We can start to fix our broken healthcare system. People will start to live instead of feeling like they have to choose to die.